My name is Joe Hedzima. Uh, welcome to Nuts and Bolts of New Ventures slash Business Plans. Uh, the name of the course was changed this year from, it used to be called Nuts and Bolts of Business Plans. But it's really never been just about business plans as a document. It's been about uh, planning um, and executing a new venture. So this year we decided to call it as it was. So it's uh, nuts and bolts of new ventures and business plans. Now, you may have an image of a business plan as a static document. You know, you drop it on someone's desk. Uh, and it may be, it may be just a finished document, but more often it's a work in progress. It could be a written document, it could be a couple of slides, but really it, it, at the core it's a shared vision of where we are and where we want to go, and it's dynamic because it, it changes. Uh, if you have a business plan that doesn't change, uh, let me know, because I haven't really found out one on that score. Now, despite the, the other reason we changed it to New Ventures is it's really not just about business. Over the years, we've had increasing number of people uh, coming into the course for nonprofit and social developmental entrepreneurship, which are not really businesses in the traditional sense. And, and so you really think of it as a course on how to think about new ideas uh, and how to get them launched and, and growing. So, uh, don't, we'll, we'll talk about business, but don't think of it as solely a business uh, type of thing. This is the 24th year of the course, and we keep doing it because people seem to get something out of it. And the reason I know that is that we get emails uh, 5, 10, 15 years later from people saying, I remember so-and-so talked about this, and I finally figured it out. And so if you find yourself in a situation like that, send an email back. We'd love to hear about it. And if we don't get emails, eventually we'll say, well, you know, like any good thing, if, if the mission's accomplished, we'll, we'll move on and do something else. Now, during the, the 24 years, we've been through bubbles. We had the internet bubble, and I had to stand up and say, how am I going to teach a class how to think about and start and execute a business when the traditional model would be five to seven years, if you were really lucky? And Hotmail back in 1996, was formed and sold one year later, 18 months later, uh, for $450 million with an idea that we're going to give away free email. It was like, I don't quite figure out how I can help you on that. Recently, you have Instagram, All right? So uh, remember both of those, because I'm going to give a word to that in a moment. Um, at the time of the internet bubble, we couldn't get good medical device companies uh, funded because fund, the financing sources were saying, look, I can put some money in this hot thing and, and get out in 18 months. Why would I want to do something that has a lot of risk? And we're going to teach you a little bit to think about how investors uh, think about ventures uh, during the course. Um, we've also seen bus when the post-internet and the financial collapse. And uh, that's a great time to start a company. Uh, because you've got to get a lot more focus to be successful. Most of the really successful, long-term, enduring companies uh, were founded during downtimes. So through all of this ups and downs, what is it all really about? And we're gonna, we'll touch on it a little bit more, but I'll, let me put the concept on the table. It's about creating value. So if you can create value, that's the first step. And then how do you capture some or all of that value? Now, that applies whether you're doing uh, a quick over-the-weekend mobile device app or you're building a drug to cure cancer or you're trying to come up with a model to uh, uh, prevent and uh, cure malaria in the third world. Have you created value and can you figure out how to capture some of that? Creating value, of course, is interesting. You know, how do you do that? Who do you create value for? Who gets value out of what I've, what I've done? Bob's going to give us a little run through that a little bit tonight, I think. And then how much value can you create? Because if you don't create enough value, it may not be worth um, the exercise. Now, traditionally, capturing value 
has been customers. That's the traditional model. I got something that somebody values and they pay me for it. And if I price it right and everything, I'll make enough money that I can do it again. That's called profit or at least getting towards profitability. But we've seen models evolve over time. So we have maybe models where you don't actually have a direct customer in the sense that they pay you, but I might be able to monetize them. You know, that sort of advertising or referral fees on the internet, that's, that's a whole different thing. We'll talk about business models tomorrow, about what are the different ways to capture value. There's also third party uh, payers. That's the US healthcare system, right? I'm developing something that's gonna help this person uh, feel better or get um, a cured of something. They can't afford to pay it or they don't pay it directly. I've got to get other people to pay it. So a complex set of capturing value models. Um, so no matter which of these you do in, in trying to create value and capture it, you need some basic things. One is people. People are the number one thing that you really need in a, in a venture. Then you need resources, sometimes dollars or relationships and skills. And there's some skills you'll learn in this class, some you'll learn on the job. And then that one that's always hard to get, but if you, if you can find it, you should, you should be happy, that's called luck. You know, sometimes if you're the fifth product in the market, you may have the best product, but you may not be able to do anything in terms of capturing value because everyone else has staked out the space. By the way, can everyone hear me up there? Okay, a lot of people here, okay. Um, so that's sort of the, the course in a nutshell. We're gonna be covering those topics. There have been about 5,000 students taking the course over the 24 years. We've had some companies hatched out of here that have gone public. Uh, we've had people uh, go on to win the 100K. Uh, it's the first class that we ever got both sides of campus together. Um, so let's, let's do a quick survey tonight. How many uh, from the student group, how many uh, Sloan? Okay, and how many engineer science? Okay, so about 50-50. Uh, architecture planning, sorry. <laughs> All right. Well, it goes without saying, and therefore I did go without saying. <laughs> I'm actually going to tell you a little bit more about who's in the class in a moment. Um, I guess the key message here is uh, you can really do it. We, we've had people uh, drop out of PhD programs and start companies out of the class. I don't necessarily recommend it, but it's happened. Um, and uh, that's, uh, that's what it's about. Now, uh, my goal is to, at the end of this class to have you sort of catch the entrepreneurial thinking virus. Um, in other words, when you think about things, think about them in an in a entrepreneurial way. Now the problem with entrepreneurship is that it's a, um, it's a lifetime incurable disease. If you catch it, it's absolutely incurable. Uh, and the good news is that it's uh, not fatal and it's highly contagious. So I really hope that you come down sick in an entrepreneurial way during the course. And uh, let me tell you a little bit about tonight. Uh, I'm gonna talk about who you are. Uh, I'm gonna introduce the teaching team, introduce our case study, and then we're gonna do a quick overview of business plan basics and take a break for team building because that's the important thing. When we realized a number of years ago that we had two groups of people you know, the Sloan side of campus and the rest never getting together. This is a great place for that to happen. And in fact, we're gonna encourage that. And then we'll have the, a break for that to happen a bit. And then Bob Jones will talk to us about, I don't know whether it's customers or creating value, we'll figure what it is. So who's in the audience? Um, as you know, if you signed up on the website for the email list, there was a place for you to put comments in. And uh, I went through and just pulled out some things that might help you understand who's here. So from uh, areas of interest, we have aero astro startups. We have people interested in energy, both renewable, extractive, and nuclear. We have some educational venture interest people. We have biotech, medical devices, building science, sports apparel, travel, architecture design, economic development, and social entrepreneurship.
the organizations that people identified with other than MIT include um, uh, Oracle, of all things, uh, US Air Force, Lincoln Labs, Legatum Center, uh, Skokovo Tech, which is the Russian joint venture that's going on. Uh, we have uh, the Broad Institute. We have a whole bunch of people, different places from Harvard. Harvard College, Harvard Medical School, Kennedy School, the Education School, and the iLabs. Bentley, Boston University, Wellesley, Simpson, Simmons, and uh, Babson. So that's quite a range, and that's only people that, that identified. People in the class, in addition to doing ventures, are thinking about ventures in the US, have, have identified China, Russia, Switzerland, Korea, Mexico, and France. And the, the business experience ranges from I don't even know anything about business to I've had 20 years of experience in business. I've only worked with startups to I've never worked with anything other than a big company. So it's quite a diverse group. And I think that's really great because a diversity in an organization really uh, helps broaden the view of things. And so the challenge tonight is to figure out how to make things concrete enough for you. So we're going to do our first equation because we are MIT after all. So your first task is to figure out what this is. And uh, if we do that, we're going to be in good shape. H equals R divided by E. And the goal is to maximize H. So what, what's a good thing to starts with H that you want to, want to maximize? Happiness. Happiness. OK, he's got it right. Now, what is R? Did I, what did I hear? Reward. Revenue. Revenue was actually, I didn't think about that when we first did it, but it had something else in mind. This is a generalizable equation. <laughs> it's not only for business, it's for life. Reward. 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 We're sort of getting there. How about reality? <laughs> <laughs> and if R is reality, what is E? Expectation. Expectation. So my job is to increase your happiness. So I want you to take your expectations to zero, and, and you're going to be happier than you could ever think. But it, it really is true. If you uh, under-promise and over-deliver, your investors will be happy, your customers will be happy, everybody's happy. So keeping a balance between reality and expectation is a lot about what you have to do in planning and executing a business. So it's a generalizable equation. Uh, and it's true, you could get infinitely happy with the zero expectations, but I don't think I've ever run into anyone with zero expectations, really. There's always some expectation. So with that in mind, uh, let's introduce our teaching team. Oh, that's, that's what you are, actually. Um, there, uh, Joe Hedzema, uh, Jos Bonson, uh, Haya Algamin, am I always, uh, Allison Yost, not, um, related to Yust, although it sounds very similar. Uh, Yano Cherry, who will come in on the last night, and our highly paid uh, volunteer speakers, which I think last time I figured out we paid them enough to buy one cup of coffee. Um, this is a little bit about me. Um, currently senior lecturer at Sloan, uh, was a former law partner at Sullivan and Worcester uh, for 17 years, where I grew a high-tech ventures group. I uh, was founding, one of the founding judges of what's now the 100K competition. I uh, was former global chairman of the MIT Enterprise Forum, currently managing director at Main Street Partners, which does technology commercialization, and co-founder and president of IP Vision, which does intellectual property analysis. We'll see some of that maybe with, when Yano comes in. In the course, so you can contact me at jgh at mit.edu. Um, I've also been involved in a variety of capacities with over 100 companies, probably 150 now. Uh, from investing to uh, founder to uh, board member. Uh, Joost Bonson. Joost, do you want to say something? Sure. You can use the mic here because they're, they're recording. Thanks, Joe. I, good to have you all here. I uh, actually started at MIT in these buildings as, a, as an electrical engineering undergraduate and was an entrant in the first year of the 100K. Then fewer K was only 10,000 dollars is a grand prize. I do believe you had at least a third of the entrance, is that correct? 
not quite quarter? a sixth. Six, but a sixth, okay. The key is that of those six, that one sixth of the total number of entries, uh, none of them won. And and when I later ran the Hunter K as a lead organizer for two years, one of my missions was to help my, you know, people who followed in my footsteps enter and do better. And that process included helping Joe take this IAP offering and dial it up, turn it into the first enduring credit-bearing IAP class here uh, in MIT's January session. Just, you'll hear more from me later in the week and next week, but just to give you a taste of some of the stuff that, that I've had my fingers in, creating an educational media venture called How Tunes, it's been out from the MIT Media Lab, um, served in various capacities in a variety of things that MIT does that, that have something to do with entrepreneurship, ran the Founders Project, which is the first attempt to do a global census of all alumni entrepreneurs uh, ever come up with the bottom line of how many thousand uh, companies started, how many uh, millions of people employed, uh, and so forth, and, and was and have been heavily involved in building up the, the entrepreneurial networking landscape here, connecting you with not only one another for the purpose of starting and building new teams, but also tapping into our alumni network. Uh, both here at the Institute as well as our peer colleges. We're in a planetary epicenter for uh, interesting technology and education, so we really benefit from having the rich connections that Joe mentioned earlier. Over the course of these two weeks, and for that matter, over the course of the life arc of your ventures and beyond, we want to continue to help you uh, uh, maximize those ties. And that'll be the subject of, uh, of our topic On later this week. Thursday. In fact, Yost under is too modest. He really has been the glue that's connected a lot of ventures together. It's an amazing thing to see. Um, and uh, someday he's going to actually write the history. I keep telling him, please do it. But uh, so once again. <laughs> and our uh, TAs, we have uh, two TAs this year. Uh, Haya al Gamin, hands up, please. These are people you really need to know. They are the real power in the course. Uh, she's a Sloan MBA student. Uh, last, I think your last gig was at the Qatar Foundation for Science, Education, Community Development. My, I just took it off your bio. Uh, molecular biology undergraduate working on her squash game. And I'm sure we'll hear some more about that. And uh, Allison Lynn Yost is PhD candidate in mechanical engineering. And um, uh, was a, uh, well, been mechanical engineering all from the beginning and has learned the mechanics of soccer. You were a division one soccer player as I recall. So again, those are the two key people in the class. The um, email to reach them is either this one, 15975-TA at mit.edu. That's because they changed the course name but not the list. So we actually put a new one in called nuts and bolts-TA at mit.edu. So you can try one or the other. It should, it should work. All right. Now, a case study. Um, as a background of the things that are talked about in the course, there's a case that actually came through the 100K called Virtual Inc. And Yonald Cherry was the uh, founder of this, and he's, he's particularly an interesting fellow by the Virtual Inc. Uh, it was a computer peripherals company whose product, uh, lately product, automatically transcribes what goes on a whiteboard into your computer. And here's part of the pitch. If you've got the course reader, did everyone was able to get to the course reader? Stellar was down for part of the day. Okay, uh, you'll see the uh, the plan in there. Uh, why do we do it? Well, uh, first of all, the concept is easy to understand. It's not high tech. It, there's a lot of technology, but the idea that you can uh, draw something on a whiteboard and capture it digitally, any any surface, uh, is is an interesting concept. You sort of get it. It was a 50K entrant back in the day of the 50K. Uh, it's an interesting story of the times and the company. This company raised a, a large amount of money, and it was an interesting ride. And Yonald um, took a couple of cycles before he hit a, a company out of the 100K. And uh, he's particularly um, candid in describing within the confines of this class what happened and what he learned from it. So, Often, you know, it's so easy when you, you bring in somebody who said, well, I started a company and we called it Instagram and 
I sold it for a billion dollars uh, 12 months later. You don't really learn anything from that. But when you have somebody come in and tell you what it's really like, uh, you learn a lot more. We will reference the plan from time to time in the course, and the full plan is in the course reader. Do not assume it is a model plan. Every year when it comes time to put in the executive summary, we get some people copying the same format. It's not a model plan, it is a plan. And uh, we'll try to talk about that as we go. So business plan basics, overview. I'm going to run through this. The slides will be available after class on the website both Stellar and the nuts and bolts .mit.edu. Uh, do you have the people or? The paper where we have all the details on what uh, things people are interested in. Uh, we will try to put you together. Uh, we, we, when people fill, the question is will we share all the details that people put into the registration? And, uh, since we didn't set up any specific uh, privacy type things or permissions, I don't want to just send that out, but we'll try to facilitate uh, things. So if you're particularly interested in one of those or you want to, we'll give you time to talk. Uh, so the presentations will uh, be online so you don't have to sort of sit there and copy. I'm going to run through a whole bunch of slides here to give you an overview both of a business plan and some concepts that are intended to lay a foundation for the speakers that come. Uh, if something's unclear, you know, interrupt. We'll try to answer the questions, but I'm really going to sort of punch through this. This is the MIT fire hose approach. Uh, we're going to throw a lot at you. As I said, some of it sticks today. Some of it will become evident five years from now. Okay, so why write a business plan? Uh, what should be in it? And then we're going to talk about it as a financing document. So why write a plan? Does People know who this person is? Dwight D. Eisenhower, Supreme Commander, Allied Forces Europe in World War II, led D-Day invasion, became the 34th President of the United States. Sort of a credible kind of guy. He said plans are worthless. So that's the end of the course. <laughs> <laughs> if plans are worthless, why do you do them? Well, because planning is everything. So it's really about thinking through what it is you're trying to do, you know, what's the best way to get it done, try to identify risk, et cetera. So we put it in the context of a plan, but it's really about planning. And uh, it's been very popular re recently, you know, do startups really need formal business plans? Um, this was a Wall Street Journal article, and this was academic research. And I think the basic point here is that it, I've seen, as I go around the country, I see business plan courses where it's about the plan, and you just know at the end of the day, nobody has any intent to actually start a company. It's an academic exercise. So if you approach a business plan as, oh, I got a course and I got to write a business plan, you know, that's fine. It's just like any other course. The real question again is, you know, what are you planning to do and how are you going to get there? So again, why write a business plan? Well. Uh, because I have to. I can't really get financing without some sort of plan or some document that looks like a plan, whether it's a slide show or whatever. Um, I might need it for um, strategic partnering. I need maybe to explain business to customers or suppliers and maybe to attract key people. That's some of the reasons people say. But I really think the reason is because you need to understand your business. And you can only do that by sitting down and trying to work through. You need to understand um, the process of going through that, people don't uh, plan to fail, they often fail to plan. A great comment by someone. You really want to figure out who are your customers and users. Um, you know, will they buy or use your product or service? Uh, what will they pay or, or how do you make money from doing this? Uh, how, do you, how do you actually do it? You know, think of Netflix, simple concept, but how do you actually do the logistics to make it work? Um, and what resources, people, money, technology, et cetera, will you need? That's sort of, you need to understand that, and that's what a business plan helps you do. So as I mentioned in the introduction, it's really simple. Whether you're doing a Web 2.0, a biotech, or a nonprofit social, it's create value and figure out how to capture it. So there are great situations where people 
create value and then they, they can't capture it. So you think of even Facebook today, huge value there, but they're still struggling to really capture any big portion of it. Instagram may have great value. I don't know quite what their model is for capturing it. And sometimes you're in a situation where there's an opportunity to capture a large group of users and there's value in there and you can attract enough investment that you can figure it out on the fly or down the road how you capture the value. So the, the, the concept is simple, the answers are not. You remember the social network movie? Everyone seen that? How many people have, by the way? Okay. So the uh, question is, do you have to be a, a total idiot to be successful? Uh, that, well, that's another question. So here's a, a scene you may have remember um, from the social network. Eduardo says, it's time to monetize the site. And Mark says, what does that mean? It means it's time for the website to generate revenue. No, I know what that means, but uh, I'm asking you, how do you want to do it? Uh, advertising. No. Do you remember this thing? We have 4,000 members. This is, this is Facebook, which has a, how many? Two billion now? Billion and a half? Okay. Because uh, the Facebook is so cool. If we start installing pop-ups for Mountain Dew, it's not going to... Well, I wasn't thinking Mountain Dew at some point, but I'm talking about the business, the company, the site. Now, we don't even know what it is yet. We don't know what it is. We don't know what it can be. We don't know what it will be. We know that it's cool. That's a priceless asset. I'm not going to give it up. When will it be finished? Do you remember what he said? It won't be finished. That's the point. The way fashion is never finished. So that's an example of something that had value that's a continuing, evolving thing. And I think it's true even today that they're still trying to figure out where they really have value in Facebook. So concept simple, answers or not. Now here's a, here's a visual to keep in mind as you think about a, a business plan. At the top, it's a pyramid. At the top, there's the mission or vision statement that you could be able to articulate that other people can get behind. And then underneath that is an elevator pitch and an executive summary. And then maybe a PowerPoint uh, presentation. And underneath that is the full business plan, if you end up writing a full plan. And underneath all of that is some real deep foundations. So that when you start talking about something and somebody questions it, you can dig all the way down and have supporting thing. That's the goal. You don't always get there. But if you can think of this pyramid as a way of approaching what you're doing, it's helpful. The mission statement is probably a paragraph. The elevator pitch, 30 seconds. We used to measure it by the, most of the venture capitalists used to be in the high rise buildings. And so you have to have the speed of the elevator. Uh, now a lot of them are in low rise buildings. So you have slower elevators, so you have to do your pitch faster. The elevator pitch for the, does everyone know what an elevator pitch is? I hear we have some winners in the audience, maybe up there. <laughs> it's when somebody turns to you and says, what are you doing? And you're able to get back to them and say, we do X for Y and we provide value. You just have, you're able to tell people exactly what you're doing. Executive summary is three to five pages. A PowerPoint, uh, purple, people heard of the 10, 20, 30 thing, that's Guy Kawasaki, uh, 10 slides. 20 minutes, 30 point uh, font. Uh, I don't follow that rule at all, but that's 10, 20, 30. Full business plan could be 20 to 30 pages and the detailed foundation is whatever it is. So the question is who should write the plan? Uh, maybe the founder, maybe the team. You can even hire somebody if you want, but you basically have to own it. Uh, we have a lot of good stories. There's a company that <clears throat> outside of um, the Enterprise Forum uh, where they were having a meeting and one of the people that participated in the, uh, what was that, the 10K was sitting there saying, I'm not sure what I'm going to do this summer. I said, I have some entrepreneurs that really could use some help because they don't know how to really write a plan. We hopped in his truck, went up, saw the guys. Uh, he joined them. Um, the company was five or six people there, and together over a period of time, 
uh, they ended up taking it public because the founders really didn't know how to write a plan, didn't know how to think about it, but they were very good at what they did. So at the end, the founders did own the plan. One of the founders is still CEO of a public company years later. Um, now, just sort of some logistics. Uh, what, should be, what should the size of the plan be or the packaging? You know, avoid the three inch thick binder. You know, if people, um, if you do have a written plan, people might throw it in a, in a briefcase, hop on a plane, they're not gonna look at a three inch thick binder. Um, it doesn't really matter how you bind it other than it looks somewhat professional. It's, you're presenting your image. Um, you should, um, did I miss something? Okay. It's a selling document, ultimately. Entrepreneurs are always selling. If you don't feel comfortable being a salesperson, you gotta get comfortable to be an entrepreneur. We think of selling as selling products, but you're always selling, you're selling, you're financing people, you're selling people to join, come join me, here's the vision. You're selling customers, uh, you're always selling. That's, that's the CEO's or the entrepreneur's job. So make sure the document has some excitement, but it has to be defensible. In a full plan, you could have all of these sections. And in many cases, we don't have full plans, or they're not fully baked. But I'll touch on some of these as we go through here about what, what should be in those. It's really in your, in your mind as you think about the business, these are the kind of things you need to think about. Uh, notice that I, don't, I didn't put technology in as a separate uh, section. And that's primarily for the technical people in the audience. People don't really buy technology in most cases. I mean, sometimes they, they're always buying technology to do something. And so the important part in a business plan is to figure out what it is that you're adding value to. And the technology may be the way in which you add value, just as the business model might actually be the way. <coughs> um, so, but normally technology is not automatically a section in, in a plan. Now, what about a, the cover page? Well, and this, this sounds sort of, um, trivial, but I've seen cover pages without basic information. Like, you know, how do I reach these people? Hey, a great plan, how do I reach them? Uh, so name, address, telephone, email, confidentiality legend. We will have a session on law that will cover both confidentiality and securities uh, law legends. Uh, but those are things that should be there. Every year, by the way, uh, people hand in the executive summary and they don't think about putting some of those things on there. So you're, you're warned. Here's the uh, virtual ink uh, cover page, 1997. Uh, a lot of things haven't changed. Uh, this is the uh, uh, confidentiality and uh, uh, copy control thing that they put on it when they started to go out with it. You know, saying this is confidential stuff, please treat it. The reason to put copy numbers on them is for securities law purposes. And I'll explain that when we get to the legal thing. Now, unfortunately or fortunately, you eventually have to deal with lawyers. And when the lawyers got a hold of the plan, that's what the legend looked like. <laughs> so it don't, you know, I'll ask you to memorize that. And right. So there are some rules that you do have to follow. Uh, make sure in the process that you get the right people and figure out how to do that in smaller font. Um, table of contents. Um, it's surprising the number of plans over the years that I don't have a table. It's a 20 page document with no table of contents and you can't find stuff. So the question is, what, what section do you think investors read first? Yeah. Opportunity. The opportunity. Yeah. Probably the executive summary, because that's supposed to, as you'll see in a moment, how it all fits together. But the opportunity ought to be evident uh, from that. What do you think the second thing is that investors read? People, right. So if that's the way they read it and you don't have a table of contents, you know, and they're doing like this. You know, if you're doing it electronically, put links in it. Um, what's this slide? Ah. Okay, sorry, on my thing, I chop off the top. Uh, so it's the first thing investors read. It's like a resume, the executive summary. It's like a resume is for your full plan. The goal is to get an interview, 
to give the pitch. So when you take your resume and you go in for a job, the idea is that people will look at that and say, this is an interesting person. I need to know more about the person. And then you get the follow-on interview. So the executive summary or the elevator pitch or whatever is really about how do I get people to say, I'd like to hear more about that. And um, what do investors really look for? We know what they read, but what are they really after? And I think I won't, you have a different way of putting it, but I'll, also I'll let you do it. I call it the three whys. I say when I read something, why this? Why is this an important thing that these people are proposing to do? Is it going to make a major difference? Is it a big problem? Why? Why are they doing it? Why is this important? Why now? Why is now the right time to do this? I have lost more money being on the bleeding edge of technology um, you know, and find 10 years later that somebody finally did what I saw 10 years ago and invested in. So sometimes you have to have the right time when things come together. And then um, why this team? Why is this team the right team to do this? And I think that's really at heart what they're looking for. Why is this a big opportunity or something important? Why is now the right time? Because something's changed or things have come together or sensors are cheap now and we couldn't have done it five years ago or there's been a change in the law or something. And then the fourth why, if you get through the first three, they're looking at why won't this work? So they're looking for something really important and upside and then they're worried that it won't work. So if you can address that in both your thinking about how do you present what you're doing and, and put yourself in the, in the seat of someone reading it who's asking these basic questions, it may help focus you a bit. Um, executive summary, uh, two to five pages max uh, should be, it's, it's really hard, it's the hardest thing to write because it's, it's, it distills everything else that you have there. And uh, if you really are good at doing it, you'll write it at the end. Maybe you do a draft at the beginning, you fill it in, and then you come back. And it's, uh, it's just like I mentioned before, a resume. It's just like the elevator uh, pitch is to the executive summary, uh, like the executive summary is to the business plan. So you hop in an elevator with an investor, you give the pitch, oh, I'd like to see the executive summary. Read the executive summary, come in and we'll talk uh, with, the, with the whole crew. It tells who you are, what your strategy or vision is, what you're doing or propose to do, what is the market, you know, how much money and what are the resources, and why, if you can get all of this in there, why are you the right guys to do it and how will you prevent others uh, from uh, taking over once you're there. And it should be something that when, when the person finishes reading it, they should be able to explain it exactly to someone else. So this is an example of two executive summaries. Uh, the one on the left is one called, these are real ones, People's Express, which was one of the first low-cost airlines. And the one on the right is electronic components. And I just do it to show you the difference in present presentation can make a big difference. So this is the uh, electronic components. Can everyone read it? Is it clear enough? Let me just read it for you. Executive, uh, sorry, electronic components is a startup company that will make a variety of electronic components. I swear to God, this is a, a true executive summary. Beginning with a new type of aluminum-based capacitor. This unique product, coupled with an excessive demand for capacitor devices, will provide us with an ample share of the capacitor market and numerous opportunities for expansion into related electronic components. You with me so far? OK. Uh, the founders are dedicated and determined to make the venture a successful pro and profitable entity as opposed to being a total failure. Uh, technical expertise is provided by James F. Lynch, who's been involved in designing capacitors for 11 years, got a bachelor's degree from MIT. That alone, that sentence, 11 years in capacitors at MIT, might actually get somebody to say, tell me more about it. But I can almost assure you, without those two sentences, you know, you know nothing, and you've read two paragraphs. And then it goes on. It says it's uh, technologies for capacities uh, changing rapidly, and then we have an opportunity. And, and then it almost reads like a grant proposal. You know, we're going to use this and this. 
Uh, they do say that the principals are putting their own money in, which is also an important factor. Now, compare in contrast people's express and see how quickly they get to the point and whether you get an idea. So the eastern seaboard of the United States is ripe for the entry of a new super efficient low cost air carrier to provide quick, reliable inner city air transportation. So do you know what they're doing? That's pretty clear right there. Such an entity would bring to the Northeast the same benefits that have accrued to other areas of the United States. So people have done it before. There's an opportunity in the Northeast. The chief uh, among the factors are frequent jet commuter service between major cities, prices competitive with private automobiles, and fulfillment of the congressional goals in enacting the Airline Deregulation Act of 1978. So that's the why now. Something has happened that's now provided this as an opportunity. And then you read on a little bit and you realize they're bringing new technologies and probably doing non-union. But you have a much better sense of what it is they're doing than you did with the electronic components. So just keep those two in mind as you're looking at it. Um, this was the Virtual Inc. executive summary. Uh, I like some of this. I don't like all of it. Um, but I'll let you read it. Uh, you have it in the course materials. Okay, the body of the plan. So we got the executive summary. Yeah. yeah so, sometimes I hear about the uh, entrepreneurs that they spend, the, like, they go around 50 investors before someone agrees to pay the money. So is it, I mean, is it because of their plan was not written very well, or it could be nobody believes in their technology? Yeah, so the question is, you, it's, it's actually not atypical to go and talk to 50 investors before you get something. But <coughs> it there's never a, a reason, there are very few reasons for an investor to turn you down and just say we're not interested, especially if with the pedigree that you people will have because there may be something there. So there is this whole problem of they'll keep you interested, <clears throat> but they're not quite there. And it's, it varies on the situation. It may be they don't really understand it. Uh, they're not ready to commit uh, resources to do their own due diligence. Um, it could be you know, you're a sole entrepreneur and they really would like to see more of a team. There are a whole bunch of reasons why it'll take a while before you connect up. And you may never. Uh, I don't want to have people leave the class thinking the only way to finance a business is with venture capital. Because very few of all of successful companies really get venture capital. Um, there are certain industries in which you need it because you have huge capital requirements. And one of the issues that VCs have today is uh, they have to put a lot of money to work, and a lot of the new opportunities don't require as much money. You know, you can do a, a web, a mobile web startup for a lot less than you can to develop a drug. So, the, my point is, the clearer the the what you present is, the the faster you'll get, hopefully, to a decision, and the fewer investors you'll have to deal with. So, I can't answer that other than as a Well, the question is, remember, it's a re that's the executive summary. So the question is, you're an investor. Would you call him in for a meeting based on that? You might, right? Because you may have heard something's going on in capacitors. Here's somebody with 11 years experience and an MIT degree. Is it worth 20 minutes of my time to see, since he couldn't articulate it very well, Am I willing to spend 20 minutes to find out whether there's something really there? I'm pretty clear right now that he wouldn't probably be the person to lead this company, except maybe technically, because he hasn't put together a plan that shows he's sort of taken it all together. Uh, and the People's Express thing, when you read a little bit more of it, you'll see that there's some experienced people behind it. So again, it becomes a people thing, and they're better at articulating. So I suspect we'd probably end up talking to both. But if, if Lynch was not an MIT grad, you know, I'm not sure. Um, so the body of the plan, uh, so we're beyond the executive summary. Now we're digging into it a little bit. These are just some of the things that you want to get in there. You know, what's the market opportunity? In the a, electronic components, we knew it was large, but we didn't know how big. Uh, how big's the bread, bass, uh, bread box? Is it growing fast or slow? And is this the right time 
uh, for the product or services. Again, why now? There's sometimes convergence of opportunity and solution. So we had the 100K, uh, 50K at the time, semi-final award ceremony, you know, to, you know, here are the fi semi-finalists, and one team came up and they said, well, I guess you didn't like our, our plan. And I said, well, I, tell me, you know, who was your plan? Uh, what was your plan? Because back then we didn't actually know the names associated. We were the guys that were going to, we had a plan for a new air traffic control system in the United States. And I, I remember that. That was a fascinating thing. I didn't know all about, you know, how you could have missiles guided in on, on air traffic control stuff. And, and it looked like you had a superior uh, solution. But, uh, well, why weren't you interested? Well, because, you know, you, you have to replace the whole air traffic control system to do this. Oh. Well, didn't you know that the FAA had put out an RFP for a new air traffic control system for the United States? No. You never told us that. That would have been a great opportunity because there had been a change. Somebody wanted a system, and these guys had the right solution. But they never thought to tell people, you know, the FAA wants a new air traffic control system. We have the best one for the following reasons, and we have a prototype working. Are you interested? So sometimes right time, and we looked at it and said there's no reason why this should be a, a business at this point because we didn't know that fact. Uh, the market analysis, again, trying to figure out how big the market is, who's there, and a classic that you'll hear from investors, which first time you hear it brings you up short if you're not aware of it. If you win, who loses, and what are they going to do about it? So if you disrupt the market, the entrenched people there, what are they going to do? And how are you going to protect against that? And sometimes, I mean, that's an important question. Again, these are things investors are asking, but you ought to be asking that too, because the most valuable resource that you put into a company is your time. You know, we, we only have a certain number of years on the earth. There's plenty of money out there. You know, if you can't get convinced that what you're doing is really something that you feel passionate about, that you can get to something, uh, then you shouldn't be investing your most re uh, valuable resource. I know somebody who's been looking at a whole bunch of opportunities recently and uh, turning, turning them down. Well, anyway, marketing plan. What's, you know, how are you going to get to market, uh, pricing and distribution, sales tactics? Who's going to be the first customer? Why will they buy it and why will they buy another one? is a question people have. And again, you've got to know the, the VC lingo. Will the dog eat the dog food? You've got a great recipe for dog food, but what evidence do you have that the dogs are going to want to eat it? Uh, when we go through the individual sessions, these will be fleshed out. But these are the things you're trying to get at. Uh, development plan. Um, where, where are you today versus where do you need to be? I've seen uh, plans where people are quite far along and they don't don't say where they are. And if you don't know that, it's, it can be a real negative. Um, as you try to plan your development of technology, if you're a technology-based company, or if you're trying to pull things together, if you're assembling other things, try to figure out how to uh, make sure that the activities you do and the amount of money and resources you have line up. And try to avoid what I call the nuclear fusion problem. We've been working on nuclear fusion for, what, 50 years? And the problem is until it actually works, nothing works. So if your business says, I've got to solve the entire problem before I have something valuable, that's a hard one to get funded. I looked at, uh, in the very early days, uh, a, a company uh, plan called Zipcar. People are familiar with Zipcar? Well, Zipcar, I mean, I'm, I'm just thrilled that they're, they've done what they did, but it's not necessarily been a good investment for anyone. There were so many moving parts in that. You know, you had to get the, the, the cities lined up. You had to get the parking place. There's a bunch of technology. So there were a lot of things that said this is just much too complex and out of their control. And, uh, you know, that was not an interesting one. And, and I think there was an article in the Wall Street Journal about a month ago that said there Few, if any, of the investors have actually made any real money out of Zipcar. Although I think it's a wonderful, it's been a game changer for that whole way of transportation. 
it just may not be a, an interesting investment. Uh, action plan, identification of credibility testers. You know, as you know, as as en engineers, we're used to thinking about all the problems that have to be solved in order to get the complete solution. And the the trick, though, from an investment viewpoint, is what can I do that will uh, reduce uh, risk, will remove credibility problems. So, for example, suppose you came and said, I've got a, I've got a plan to build a bridge, uh, say the Golden Gate Bridge before it was built. You'd think, wow, big opportunity, going to cost a lot of money. If I did it traditional engineering way, it would take a long time to even figure that out. So I might think, well, what are the key things that if I could nail down, I could de-risk the idea. So maybe I would lock up access routes or uh, do a simple set of tests that would show how far the bedrock is. So you try to identify what are the problems and see if you can figure out how to overcome them. And then once you do that, you can start to build value. So again, coordinating what you do to try to reduce or eliminate dependencies and risk. Um, appendices, there's, if you need to put things in, throw them in the appendices. If, you, if you're selling product and you have literature, if you have uh, trade press, patents or other stuff, that all goes in the appendix, uh, not up front. Uh, always have somebody read it, independent reader. I don't know about you, but if I've written something and rewritten it twice, uh, it's like object-oriented programming. I don't even think of what, what's in the module. Oh, this is where I talk about the customer. And you know, I can't read it anymore. So you need to have somebody fresh read it. Um, the accountant des should be, or somebody accounting training when you get to financials and a lawyer before you actually go out to uh, raise any money. And we'll explain why that is on the legal night. Uh, business plan is a financing document. Um, think about it as uh, three kinds of reads. The first is reading like a resume. Uh, and the second is to justify the investment. This is how an investor would look at it. And the third would be to commit to a plan. Is there actually something here that I think that can work? If you don't make the first cut, B and C don't happen, right? So if you don't, it's like a resume. If people don't see something interesting on the resume, you don't get the, the interview. So what uh, helps you make the, uh, the first cut? Well, the idea, maybe an idea that's too good to ignore, if you can get that in front of people. A financial promise too good to turn down because it, you've, you've, you've figured out the, you know, something could be very profitable. A team good enough to believe in. Most investors will say they'd much rather invest in a, a top flight team and a second rate idea than the other way around. Uh, sorry, a, a good idea and a second rate team. Because things always change and it's the, you know, do you have the right people together to be able to adapt to that change? Yoast, you'll probably have some examples of people that did that and, and probably didn't do well. So that'll become more clear as we go on. An action plan that's credible and focused. Oh, I actually think these guys could do that. You know, that could get you there. Uh, details that give assurance, insight, uh, commitment, and follow through. Uh, that they actually know what they're about. <coughs> and uh, format and style that shows passion and sanity. Um, I've seen very interesting plans that are not passionate, and I've seen plans that are, look like they're total insanity. So uh, neither of those make the cut. Uh, what, what other reasons? Well, insufficient market. You know, it, uh, it's just not big enough to be worth the effort. Uh, Non-credible technology, too wild, too blue sky, not protectable. We'll talk about IP later, or too mundane. This is just an incremental assessment. You know, if you were looking at a, uh, a, semi a semiconductor uh, chip company and you say, I have a technology that will double the speed of the chip in five years, well, that's probably not that interesting because the market's moving faster than that. An investment too large for the promise. So if the market turns out to be 100 million and I need 20 million to get there, that's just too much money for the size market and a failure to understand the market. Uh, other things, uh, plans that are too optimistic. Uh, one of the things, I don't know if you saw the Kickstarter things in the paper recently about uh, 
the Kickstarter people not being able to deliver the product because actually it's harder than they thought. That's an example maybe of too optimistic. Uh, not ambitious enough. We talked about that. Regulatory barriers insufficiently addressed. I read a plan once that was clearly needing FDA approval and nowhere in the plan did they mention FDA. Even if it didn't need FDA approval, they should have been smart enough to say, our device, our thing does not require FDA approval because of this. So I looked at it and say, they, they either don't know what they're doing or they don't know how to convey it. Uh, and there are some other things there. Um, cosmetic reasons, there are cosmetic reasons. You can't understand it and somehow there's nothing there to make it uh, come through to you. Uh, too jargony, we just can't figure out what the business is. Uh, projections that are really naive. Sloppy misspelling, poor grammar, poor quality printing. You know, it's, it is, if you actually have a document, it's, it's a first representation of what you are. If you put a resume out there with all sorts of typos in it, uh, you know, would you expect to get the job interview? Um, sometimes too long, ignores the basis, and just really not there. So here's what we've covered. Why write a plan? What should be in it? And the business plan is a financing document. I want to bring us back to the supported vision thing. This, this will be on almost every session. We'll bring you back to this. Again, the idea is you want to be able to have enough depth at the bottom and distill it down to something clear enough that people can understand towards the top. And it, if you can distill it down, but when they, when they actually start to dig into it, your, your foundation is not, not there, it's going to fall apart. So you've got to get all these things sort of aligned up. I want to do a break here for team building. Now the reason for that is, other than it's a good thing to get your teams together, uh, part of the requirement for the course is going to be um, uh, a written executive summary. And we really encourage you to do that in teams. And this is a good chance for you to practice that up. And we're going to try to encourage uh, that in a variety of ways. Uh, and by, I think, this Saturday, we'll ask you, you know, what is your team? So take the next uh, maybe 15 minutes and turn to someone you don't know and start talking.